Some people have a love of words. I have a love of the sound of words. It may have started with Rupert Bear, all those wonderful rhyming couplets. Hi there, what are you looking at? Calls Algy, eager for a chat. What do you have to eat first thing? Asks Rupert without answering. Why, gooey flakes, his chum replies. Try winky bickies, Rupert cries. You get fine picture cards with those, look birds. And some spare cards he shows. And then, listening to my dad tell my sister and I a bedtime story. There on the bottom bunk, head on the pillow, covers pulled up snug and warm, I was transported into new worlds. I'd hear about a boy and his grandpa with a golden ticket off to Mr. Wonka's chocolate factory, or the daring deeds of small furry hobbits. Long before Andy Serkis ever became the voice of Gollum, my dad had brought the Smeagol to life in my imagination with his long S's as he talked about pocketses and fish and my precious. Now, I have the absolute pleasure of reading to the children in my life and watching as they stare up at me with eyes like saucers as the words I read dance through their minds and explode like fireworks. And I've taken this passion into my working life as a voiceover artist voicing the words of others and as a tone of voice consultant, talking to people about talking to people. So I'd like to spend a little time with you today exploring this wonderful instrument that we have and the beautiful sounds we can make with it. Follow me, if you will, down the rabbit hole into the amazing world of tone of voice, how it all begins, why it matters, and what you can do to get the most from yours. Once upon a time, there was you at the very beginning of your life. You started hearing in the womb, and as low notes travel better through fluid, you're more exposed to the bass sounds in music and the vowels in your mother's voice rather than the consonants. Two to four months after you're born, and you begin to react to different tones. You may cry if you hear something loud or harsh or Gurgle with delight if you hear something that soothes or pleases you. And then there's smiling. People often smile at you, and you smile right back. You begin to experiment with your vocal folds, combining consonants and vowels. Mama, dada, at the front of the mouth, and kaka, gaga, back of the mouth. A study carried out by Cardiff University's School of Psychology found that babies between the ages of 14 and 18 months reacted in the same way to the words whoops and there, whether those words were said in English or Greek, because the babies were responding to tone clues, not to the words themselves. So we start to pick up on tone clues very early on in our lives and work out whether our significant others are happy or sad, angry or anxious. We quickly learn the difference between no and no. It's part of our survival instinct. Tone is how we judge intention as a listener and how we communicate meaning as a speaker. A team at Glasgow University did a piece of research into first impressions when we hear a new voice. Now, for this, they used just the word hello, a word that has no real meaning and sometimes lasts less than a second. And what they found is from just this one word, 320 people could pretty consistently pick out personality attributes in the speaker's voice. Things like likability, dominance, trustworthiness, Talk about, you had me at hello. So why can we do that? Well, their theory was that it's about approach or avoidance. We want to work out very early on in an interaction with someone new whether we feel safe and trust that person. So we use tone as a marker. Because of that, tone affects our relationship with every new person that we meet. 
An advert on TV recently began with the words, we'll meet nearly 80,000 people in our lives. Very generalized, but even so, imagine if that were true, and you had the power to influence how those 80,000 people react to and respond to you. So how do you do that? Well, firstly, by building awareness. Sharpen up your noticing skills, because the clues are right in front of you. When you speak, are people engaged and present? Or are they fidgety, distracted, closed off? The clues are there in body language, in facial expressions, in nonverbal cues like sighing or tutting. Secondly, make friends with your voice. Love it. Nurture it. Practice with it like you would a cherished musical instrument, a Stradivarius or Fender Stratocaster. Interestingly, we gauge music and tone in the same part of our brain, the right hemisphere. Dale Purves, a research professor at Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, has said, musical tonality conveys emotion by imitating the tonality of speech. Music imitates tone. So right in here, you have a chart-topping band or symphony orchestra capable of emitting sounds that will change the mood of the people listening, just like your favorite music can. Who here likes the sound of their voice? Put up your hand if you are happy and content with your unique sound. So few of us are. It's like our sound is so personal and so revealing that suddenly we become embarrassed and self-critical. But also, we hear our voices very differently to how everyone else does, because we hear it internally and externally. Internally, sound bouncing off our bones and resonating inside, and then the external element, too. So then, when we only hear the external element, on a voicemail or a recording, suddenly we sound higher and weaker than we expected. As part of making friends with your voice, I have to admit that most of us are terrified of public speaking. Now, there is a name for this phobia. Does anyone know it? It's glossophobia, the fear of public speaking or of speaking in general. Some studies show that in a lineup of the usual suspects, so things like darkness, flying, insects, lifts, we fear public speaking more than we do death. <laughs> Which puts me in mind of a kind of Eddie Izzard comedy skit, you sir, public speaking or death? <laughs> oh, I'll take death, please. Very well. Death it is. But how you sound is too important to only be left for those moments of public speaking when you're doing a speech at a wedding or a presentation at work. It affects teachers and kids and how we learn, job interviews and whether you're the chosen candidate, dating and whether you create that spark. It influences our relationship with friends, and strangers, and colleagues, and loved ones, and children. So here are four ways to improve your tone and strengthen your relationships with those 80,000 people that you may impact in ways great or small. Number one is breath. If you don't breathe, you will die. I have that on good authority, but seriously, all of this stems from breath. Voice is audible air, so as with most things, the quality of what you put in affects the quality of what you get out. So whether it's noticing it, gently controlling it, breathing more deeply, or using rhythmic or regulated breathing to calm and soothe yourself, you will find that breathing pops up just about everywhere when you delve more deeply into speech, tone, good communication, confidence, relaxation, mindfulness, 
yoga, sport and fitness, mental agility, focus, awareness. It's the key to life, but it's also the key to stamina and energy and power. And who doesn't want some of that? It's a combination of control and release. Control, starting to notice where and how you're breathing, and then release. Because your best tones come when you just let go. If there's a muscle that will center you and bring you strength, it is your diaphragm. If you're not sure where that is, pop your hand on your belly and make the noise as if to clear your throat. <clears throat> it's the muscle that moves to accommodate that throat clearing. But in the words of Madame de Merte from Les Liaisons Dangereuses, one does not applaud the tenor for clearing his throat. So I invite you to look into what this muscle can do for you. It may be the single most powerful thing you do to relieve stress and anxiety and bring you calm and clarity. You will not believe how many books and online videos there are out there about breathing. Something which up until now, you probably took for granted. As for the tones that will bring you connection, Warmth. This is the sound that embodies humor and empathy and compassion and friendliness. It is a feel-good feast of a tone. It's the sound of welcome, of acceptance, of affability, of fondness and love. And it lights up both the speaker and the listener. How do you show warmth so others can hear it? You simply smile, either inwardly or outwardly. When you smile, you lift the cheekbones, the soft palate, everything opens up. The eyes, the face, the throat, and the sound that comes out is golden and glorious. Try it now. Turn to the people next to you and with your warmest smile say hello. <laughs> Just the people next to you, not the whole theater. <laughs> Warmth will bring you connection. It is the tone that keeps on giving because smiling and laughter are contagious. So you shine and feel more positive, and then the people around you do too. Warmth is the string section of your vocal orchestra, your heart voice. The next tone to master is passion, speaking with expression and energy and variety. Passion is in the richness of words. Sometimes we extend vowel sounds, perfect, outrageous, freezing cold. Try it for me now. I'll say one, two, three, go, and then I'd like you to say the word wow with all of the passion that you can. One, two, three, go. Passion is in pace. Sometimes we speed up with excitement or enthusiasm, like the quickening of your heartbeat. And sometimes we slow down in awe, just to take it all in. Passion is in good use of emphasis because you want to take the audience on that journey with you. So we vocally highlight new information or important information. Passion is in expression, bringing across the meaning of words as you say them. Linger, sizzle, harsh, soft. Passion is in changes of pitch, so using all of those different notes in your instrument. A good way to practice is by humming up and down your vocal range. So maybe when you're on your own in the shower or in the car, you can do this. Mm -hmm and explore all of your wonderful high notes and low notes and everything in between and build up your resonance. Passion is in the voice of everyone who sees wonder in the world and dwells in possibility 
and wants to share it with others. It is the full orchestra of tones, vibrant and exhilarating. And the last tone to master is confidence. Your centered tone of conviction and self-belief, knowing you have the right to speak and be heard. It is your gut voice. Supported by breath, it comes from deep within. It is the brass section of your vocal orchestra, sometimes serious, sometimes bold, sometimes heroic. Confidence comes through in relaxed lower tones. When we're nervous, we tend to breathe up here. The voice thins and the pitch rises, so it helps to bring focus lower down, sometimes by pressing the heels of your hands together as you speak and listen for those relaxed lower tones. Confidence is in a measured pace. Don't rush or feel the need to get it over with. Confidence is in pauses. Breathe. Give yourself time and space to speak. And finally, confidence is in posture. Shoulders down, everything loose and free. Okay, let's try it. I'll say one, two, three, go, and then I'd like you to say the word yes with all of the bold, powerful confidence that you can and punch the air as you say it. <laughs> Be careful of everyone else. One, two, three, go. Yes! Thank you. <laughs> Confidence is authentic and rousing. And you get it by practice because it's hard to fake. So you have to face your fears, rattle on the bars of that glossophobia. With that in mind, I'll leave you as I started with rhyme. Not from Rupert Bear this time, but the wonderful words of poet John Cooper Clarke on tone, trousers, and the vocal powerhouse that is Tom Jones. <laughs> Back in town in a black Rolls Royce, the funky, hunky housewife's choice, in one fact, he can rejoice. His trousers don't affect his voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>